came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yeah. Jesus, yours.
sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my pausing and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. And so when you walked in, you should have received a packet before we take the Lord's Supper. You should have received a packet. If you need one, just stretch your hands and we will make sure that you receive one. I see some hands here. I see some hands here. But we're going to worship the Lord in singing one more time as we pause to reflect on his sacrifice.
Good morning, BT Church. Good to see you all today. Happy Easter. Let's try that again. Happy Easter. Good to see you all, guys. Hey, guys, we've come to the, the portion in our worship service where we're going to take uh, the Lord's Supper. And so if you have your packet, I'm going to ask you to begin to kind of prepare that. If you need a packet, you can raise your hand and one of our team will come around and make sure that you get one. Now, uh, even just this morning, I was just kind of reflecting on what Easter is and what it means and, and just thinking about the fact that before the crucifixion, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. Now, it wasn't a meal just like anything else, right? I mean, I'm sure they ate and they drank, and, uh, but this was a, a, a meal that was really steeped in their Jewish culture, right? It was the Passover meal, and, and it was something that they did uh, regularly, annually, right? And so I, I, I've just imagined that Jesus and the disciples had shared this meal before. They, they had been there, kind of done that. But as I kind of imagine what it might have been like to be in the room and hearing some of Jesus' words, talking about the fact that the bread that they're about to eat is representative of, of his body that would be broken for them. And the wine that he was passing out was supposed to represent or his blood that was representative of the covenant that he was making with his people. And I would just imagine in that time where where Jesus' disciples may, maybe just anticipated there was just another meal, something in the air changed. You see, Jesus was calling them into the presence, the mindset of, of preparation, to think about what it was that Jesus' sacrifice was going to mean for them. And I would imagine that, that what, maybe they entered this room and maybe there's joy that filled the air. Maybe something, something just might have changed about their mindset, their heart, kind of the spirit of the room and got a little somber. And so I, I think, you know, today as, as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we, we can do that. We can come in, we can be somber, reflective. I think that's what, what Paul encourages in one of his, his letters. He says, we need, to, we need to really evaluate ourselves as we go through this, right? There's a preparation part of how we do the Lord's Supper here today. But man, the beauty of what we do with Easter is that we get to celebrate that, that this preparation just a few days later, would turn into celebration. That the things that Jesus was going to do on the cross would effectively and finally conquer the problems of our sins and set up for us an eternity in his presence. And so as we partake today, I want to I ask you to just take a few moments to prepare your heart, prepare your mind. But as we take, I want us to transition into a time of celebration. So can we do that today? So I'm going to ask you to peel back that first layer and, and grab that wafer. I'm just reminded of Jesus' words as he passes this out. He breaks it. He gives thanks to the Father. Thanks knowing full well that he's about to endure the most gruesome death. But thanks because he knows that even in the preparation, there's celebration that comes on the other side of it. So as Jesus took the bread, he blessed it. He broke it, and they ate You could peel back that foil on top and Jesus then takes the cup and he tells them that this, this, this is the covenant secured for us in his blood. Now a covenant is his enduring promise to us that he would finish all that he would start and that nothing could undo his work on the cross. So as we remember Jesus' words, as he passed it around, reminding them what it would, would, what it would mean for them, I would imagine it's a, little, it's a little unsure for them. But still, once they were able to see a resurrected Jesus, the same resurrected Jesus that we celebrate today, that preparation turned into a time of celebration. Let's remember as we take. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your, God, just your love for us. God, we thank you that you invite us into your redemptive purposes. And Lord, today especially, Especially today, Lord, we, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection three days later. And so, Lord, as we move through a worship service today, God, we pray that you would get all the glory. God, we pray that, that you would find us fit, not because we have worked ourselves into your favor, because we can't do that. But, Lord, we pray that you would find us fit to be a part of your family because of Jesus' finished work on the cross and the resurrection, leaving behind an empty tomb. Lord, I pray that there would be a resurrected people in this place today. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Aren't you guys so happy to be at BT Church on Easter Sunday? Amen. Well, hey guys, my name is Colin. I'm the student pastor and missions pastor, pastor for BT Church, and I'm so grateful to see you guys. I'm so glad that you chose to spend some time with us here today. If you're visiting with us today for the first time, I just want to take this opportunity to say welcome. I say this regularly, and I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. I pray that you find a home here. This is a special place to be. And so one of the ways that we want to help you kind of get connected is, is we just want to hear from you. So if you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to invite you to text the word BTVIP to the number 97000. And you can follow the prompts that are followed up through your text messages there. And we'll be able to connect with you at some point uh, this week uh, just to make sure that we can get to know who you are, pray with you, and get you connected in, in any kind of way that, that you feel like you might, might, might serve you or your family. And so um, I would encourage you guys to do that soon. Uh, now, what I also want to do is, is just invite you guys to, to uh, remember that as we, we move forward from Easter, uh, church doesn't stop at Easter, right? We have lots of stuff going on in the life of our church, and so we want to encourage you to get connected with what's going on there. You can follow up at bt.church slash events to see all that's happening in the discipleship programs and the events that are happening in our church. And so that's a great way for you to, to get connected, to be in the know about what's happening. So again, that's bt.church slash events. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to transition into a time of worship as we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And so, yes, as we clap and we praise for that, uh, we do that because we believe uh, wholeheartedly that everything that we have is given to us by the Lord. And God has invited us to share back a portion of what he's entrusted to us to him. And what we see happening with these tithes and these offerings is we get to watch as God blesses these tithes and these offerings and he uses them to further expand his redemptive reach across a world that so desperately needs him. And so we celebrate that trusting that this isn't just dropping money in a basket. We believe that this is this is a fruitful endeavor, a fruitful participation in watching God change the world to the glory of his name. Amen? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask God to, to bless uh, the tithes and the offerings today. So would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we're so grateful to be in your house. And Lord, we pray, God, that you'd be honored and glorified in all that happens in this place. Lord, we, we pray, God, that as, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, Lord, I pray that as these baskets are filled in a moment, Lord, I pray that this would just be a small indicator of the work that you intend to do across across the Rio Grande Valley, across our cities, across Texas, across the world, God. We pray that as these, as these tithes and offerings are given, Lord, we pray that these would be utilized, God, for effective ministry across the world to see your name glorified and your church built, God. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As you come and give, the prophet Micah talks about our sins being thrown into the sea never to be remembered and we thank Jesus for making that possible amen that we're not held captive by our past because we serve a risen Savior God forgives I've done everything to make you turn away I'm indebted to your goodness I don't deserve your love you took every threw it all away I know this is forgiveness this is the story of how my sins are sinking in the sea never to rise again that's what you've done for me oh what a friend my God you never let father and friend who forgives You showed me your compassion, you're worthy of my trust. Every condemnation that tried to change my name, there's no reason I don't answer. Tell them the story of how my sins are sinking in the sea, never to rise again. That's what you've done for.
on. If you're glad that he lives this morning, let's lift up our praises. Hallelujah. We serve a risen king. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Amen. If you're not excited to be at church today, we need to check your pulse. A few days ago, some of you were probably able to join us for our Good Friday service where we focused on the death of Jesus, the payment that was made for our sins. But we said that Friday night that while it was a heavy night, and it's rightfully so to remember his death and payment, our hearts, while heavy, they don't stay that way because we said Friday night that Sunday is coming. Well, Sunday is here, and church family... He is risen. If we haven't met, my name is Chris. I have the honor of serving as a senior pastor here at BT Church and the privilege of taking us into God's word today. If you have a copy of the scriptures, digital or physical, why don't you meet me in the book of Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 24 is where we will be today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday together. Let me say thanks for joining us early this morning as we added our 8 a.m. service here in McAllen uh, to make room for what we anticipate to be a full house today. So thanks for kicking off the party with us and uh, pray that you're blessed by being with us early and you have a great rest of your Easter Sunday today. Here at BT, one of the things we believe uh, strongly is that we should be a people of celebration. We think we should celebrate what God is doing. And so before I jump into the text this morning, I just wanna share this with you. So far this calendar year, we're on the last Sunday of the first quarter of the year. And 160 people have given their life to Jesus, trusting him as the Savior, the Lord of their life. And 73 people have been obedient in baptism, entering the waters of, our, uh, the, waters of the baptisteries of our campuses, uh, going public with that decision. And we have baptisms scheduled today as well. And so we celebrate the movement of God, and it is truly uh, an extension of his grace that we get to be a part uh, of this revival that's taking place here in South Texas. Well, today is Easter Sunday. That's no surprise, or I don't think it's a surprise for you. It, this, the, the events of this weekend from Good Friday to today are, uh, without a doubt, the most defining events in human history. That God in the flesh, innocent without sin, would die on a criminal's cross. He would be executed without cause. And he would do so to make payment for sin. And whose sin, we say? Well, my sin, your sin. That God in the flesh would go to the cross, that he would take his final breath and he would make payment for sin is one of the most defining moments in human history. But what would happen that first Easter Sunday, while it's hard to be so generalized, is arguably the most defining moment. Because not only did Jesus make payment for our sins when he died on the cross, necessary, but then he provided power over sin and death through his resurrection. When he walked out of the tomb fulfilling the promise that he had said that he will rise again, he will come back. And so all across the world today, people are going to celebrate what this Sunday is all about. No one gets to define what this Sunday is. Jesus defined it 2,000 years ago. And so today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this well-known story. And while many of us have been in church a long time, how does this story still apply to our lives? Because the truth is, beloved, and I say this all the time, we, we don't grow past the gospel, we grow in it. And some of us that have been in church a long time, sometimes we have a longing, which isn't bad, to maybe get in Bible studies or attend a Sunday morning service where uh, we feel that we need it to go deeper. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We, we want to understand the whole counsel of God. That's a fancy phrase to say we want to know all of the scriptures. But beloved, if our longing for the deeper things of scriptures causes us to believe that the gospel is somehow shallow, we have things upside down. There's nothing deeper in the scriptures than the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, died for the sins of the world and that he rose again in victory and offers life to all those who would believe in him. There is no deeper truth. There is no greater doctrine. There is nothing else that the believer or the non-believer needs to know so concretely. 
And so today, that's what we'll talk about. How 2,000 years later, this story of payment and power still affects us today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 36 through 53. And what I want to talk about for just a few moments this morning are five realities the risen Jesus brings to his people. This well-known story that you probably anticipated hearing, what are, what are five realities still today, some 2,000 plus years later, that the risen Jesus still brings to his people? It's what the text says in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36. As they were saying these things, he himself, he himself stood in their midst and he said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet, but while they still were amazed and disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them, and he was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. The events of Luke 24 that take place just before this story, you're probably familiar with. It's the account of the Emmaus Road. There were two followers of Jesus, one named Cleopas and the other didn't get his name in the credits. But they were walking and they were distraught because this Jesus that they had believed in, this Jesus they had put their hopes in, he was crucified by the Roman government. He was betrayed by the religious elite. And as they are walking, distraught, Jesus appeared to them. They didn't know it was him, though. And he says, what are you guys so upset about? Why the long face? And I read it with a little bit of sarcasm myself. They say, you've been living under a rock? Are you the only one that hasn't heard of Jesus of Nazareth and What the Roman government has done to him? I think they say it somewhat incredulously, like, get out of here with it. What are you talking about? Why are you making us bring this back up? And then he walks with them. Luke 24 says that he revealed to them everything in the scripture concerning himself. Why? Why? Because he's the star of the story. He starts to teach them, and and then they get to one point, and he's like, all right, that was a great talk. See you guys later. And they're like, no, no, stay with us. It's too late for you to keep going, still not knowing who it is. And so he stays. And then there's this moment where their eyes are opened. And that moment that their eyes are opened and they realize it's Jesus, he disappears. (laughs) And they say say to each other, weren't our hearts burning inside of us when he was telling us? And so they hightail it to tell their other friends. And where we pick up the story, Jesus has now appeared to the group. And when he shows up, they're kind of freaked out, right? Now, I know we read it because we're like super Christians, right? Oh, I can't believe these guys were scared. I'd have totally known it was Jesus. Yeah. They had just seen his lifeless body taken off of a cross a few days before.
And so how does this story still apply? What, what, what realities does the risen Jesus bring to us today that we still need to wrap our minds and our hearts around because it doesn't really matter how long you or I have been in church. The truth is we still need to grasp this. And so five things I want to share with you real quick that I hope will encourage your hearts this Resurrection Sunday. And here's the first thing. The reality of the risen Jesus brings peace. The reality of the risen Jesus brings peace. The first thing he says to them in verse 36, as he stood in their midst, he said, what? I'm back, right? Maybe like with a Terminator sound, right? Does he say, surprise? Does he say, told you so? The very first thing he says, peace to you. This would have been reminiscent or reflective of what he had told them several times before in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. In this world, you will have suffering. Imagine hearing that. Hey, let not your hearts be troubled. You're going to suffer. How am I not supposed to be troubled by that? Let not your hearts be troubled. Because in this world, you will have suffering, but take heart, because I have already overcome it. I've already overcome the world in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. That's important. Don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. The first thing he says to them, peace to you. A few years later, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, he would echo the words of Jesus when he would write this to the Philippian church. He would say, don't worry about anything. You ever worry about anything? You don't have to raise your hand. Don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition. Some versions say supplication. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You understand what Paul is saying? He says, don't, don't worry about anything. That, that sounds like Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled, right? Don't worry about anything, but in everything, pray with thankfulness, right? Some of us, well, I pray all the time. I don't feel thankful. I, I, I don't feel peaceful. Well, do you ever pray with thanks? <laughs> There's a recipe here. Let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving and the peace of God, what does Paul say? Which surpasses all understanding. You see how that's reflected? What did Jesus say? My peace I leave you. I don't give peace like the world gives. Paul says peace that passes understanding. We are in need of a peace that is beyond our ability to put our, put our hands on ourselves. And the first thing we need to be reminded of is that when Jesus walked out of the tomb in victory, what he offers to us still today is peace. You know, we live in the most technologically advanced time in history. The, the rate of knowledge increase is mind-boggling. I don't know how they do this, but people, they, they, they measure everything that can be known about anything. I, I think this is made up, but, you know, they say, like, most of the stats aren't real anyway, so, you know, don't hold me to this, but but I've read several places that, that everything that can be known about anything, it's quantified. And back in like 1995, wasn't that long ago, by the way, back in like 1995, it took about 18 months for the entire knowledge base to be doubled. The entire, based on several people's opinions that, are smarter than me, today the entire knowledge base is being doubled in a mere days. We've got information. You don't have the answer? Ask Google. You don't know how to get there? Pull up maps. We have more affluence. You may say, well, I don't feel like I, affluence means wealth, right? You may say, I don't feel like it. Listen, historically, when you compare human history today, civilization has more affluence than ever before. But there are more people struggling with thoughts of despair and depression and anxious living than ever before. Do you know what people desperately need? 
peace. And the world is trying to sell it. You single, just get married. You're married, not going well, just get divorced and remarried. Actually, don't remarry. Just kind of hook up. It's better. Just, just get ahead. Get the next promotion. Get some more money. Put more in retirement. Buy the next car. Get a bigger house. Give it all away. You'll feel better about yourself. The world is selling peace. And people are buying. But the peace the world gives, it can't satisfy what a heart needs. Whether it's self-indulging, the world sells peace also that that is self-denying as well. Jesus says peace to you. His peace is what we long for. But the reality of the risen Jesus also brings proof. Proof, and that matters. Proof of what? Proof of his promise. Now, now notice that in order, I'm putting proof after peace, and that's intentional. Today, we may think, oh, I have this friend, I have this family member, and, and, and they don't trust Jesus, and they have all these questions. They're super intellectual, and they're agnostic or atheist, and they... I need to learn, and there's nothing wrong with learning more, but here's the reality. The first thing people need is not proof, they need peace. Because what good is proof without the peace of God that surpasses all understanding? But he provides proof, right? What, what, what happens in the story next? He says, peace to you. They're startled. They think they're seeing a ghost. He says, why are you guys troubled? <laughs> What's up, Right? They think they're looking at a ghost. He says, why are you troubled? And why did doubts arise in your hearts? He says, look at my hands, nail pierced. Look at my feet. You know what he's doing? He's providing proof. Proof that he is the resurrected Jesus, but proof of the promise that he had told them. That's why he reiterates it here. He says, listen, I'm going to teach you guys the scriptures. I'm going to open your mind. The prophet said the Messiah would be crucified and rise three days later. The reality of the risen Jesus, hear me, beloved, it still brings proof today. Proof that that it's about more than us. That what we can accumulate and what we can attain and what we can accomplish is not going to provide what we desperately need. He offers proof. Not just that, though. and, And let me just say this before I move on quickly. Here in the story, he extends his hands and his feet. Today, most of us in this room, most likely, have already given our lives to Jesus. Amen? Do you realize that we're called to be those hands and feet today? It's just a side note. The reason why it's so important that we live according to the scriptures is we are the proof that those that are looking for peace are looking to those people you work with, the people in your family, the people at school, the people around you that know that you say you're a Christian, they are looking to see if there is anything evident in your life that is markedly different than theirs. And here's the reality, as believers, we can't necessarily point to an absence of suffering, right? We can't point to, oh, I trust Jesus, I don't have any bad days. We, we need to point to something else, and it's the peace that is the proof that our Jesus is who he says he is. The reality of risen Jesus brings proof. But number three, the reality of risen Jesus brings his presence. It brings his presence. Verse 41, after showing them his hands and his feet, but while they were still amazed in disbelief because of their joy, so you know their hearts are starting to change, they're not quite sure, but they're getting kind of excited. Because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of rolled fish, and he took it, and he ate in their presence. He didn't show up. It's a ghost. No, guys, it's me. Check it out. He didn't just show up and say, peace to you. Oh, well, you want some proof? Look at these nail-scarred hands. You've seen them? Okay, I'm gone. He stayed, and he ate with them. I hope you realize that there's an intentional building taking place here. The reality is in Jesus brings peace 
to the hearts that so desperately need it. That peace, that peace is the proof that Jesus is who he says he is. And when we understand the proof of Jesus is his peace, then our eyes are open to his presence. That he is not far off. One of the greatest struggles of the greatest minds of history is to comprehend how an all-powerful being could be so personal. People have struggled with that since, since they began to search God. Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, he struggled. He was a brilliant mind, but he struggled with how, how an all-powerful God could be near. That's why he, he, it's called deism. He believed that there was a God. He just wasn't personal. How could that being be personal? But the peace of God ushers in the presence of God. He's not far off. He's not disconnected. He's not uninterested or uninvolved. And here with his friends, he shares a meal. In the book of Matthew, his final words to his followers would be this. He gives them what's called the great commission. Go and make disciples, he says, and I will be with you always even to the end of the age. Isaiah 41, we read this, Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. Today, beloved, there may be some of us that have given our lives to Jesus. We know we are walking in that relationship, but this year and last year and the year before, they haven't been great years for us, and we feel that God is far off. We feel his presence is not near and personal. And listen to me, I am not saying that what you're facing isn't real, that it's not difficult, that it doesn't bring some heartache, but this is what I'm telling you. If you have given your life to Jesus and you feel that he is not with you, your feelings are not facts. Because when he told his followers, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age, that rings true today. He is not far off. Now, if you'd say, Chris, I don't, you're talking about giving your life to Jesus. I don't know if I've done that. Well, here's the reality of the scriptures. Without Jesus, then you are alone. But you don't have to be. You don't have to be. And for the believer who says, well, I feel alone. He hasn't gone anywhere. Have we tried to leave him behind is the question. The reality of the risen Jesus brings us and reminds us of his presence. Number four, the reality of the risen Jesus brings purpose. It brings purpose. In verses 44 through 49, we see two purposes. We see the purpose of Jesus first and then the purpose of his followers. It says in 44, he told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name. Jesus is speaking to his purpose. It says he is opening their minds to the scriptures. He says, listen, everything Moses said, basically when, just so you know, when Jesus says the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, that's the Old Testament. He's talking about the entire Old Testament. And so he's saying everything that you know to be the word of God has been about me. And then he goes on to say specifically, this is what is written. He says the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. He is speaking to his purpose. And then after that, in verse 48, he says, now you are my witnesses. You're going to give an account for what you have Seen and heard, you're my witnesses to these things. And then he says in verse 49, and I am sending you what my father promised. That's the Holy Spirit. And stay in the city until you're empowered from on high, and then you're going to be sent out. The reality of the risen Jesus opens our eyes to his purpose. Now, Western society, we are taught time and time again that it is all about us. Look out for number one, right? But here's the deal, beloved. I think intentionally Jesus speaks to his purpose before their purpose because, hear me, if we don't know his purpose, we'll never know ours. 
because there is no purpose without Jesus. He says, my purpose was to come in obedience to the Father and to die as a payment for sin and to rise in victory. That is my purpose. And beloved, there is no purpose until we understand that. Well, I want to be a great employee. I want to be a great boss. I want to, I want to build wealth for my family. I, I want to be the first one to go to college. I want to do, those are great things. None of that is evil. But none of those things or whatever else you can dream of or think of, none of that can actually be a purpose unless we can align it to the purpose of Jesus, which was to come and to be a ransom for many so that when we believe that and that peace fills our hearts and that peace provides the proof that this is actually what life is all about and that proof points us to his presence, then we understand, yeah, I need to be the best husband or wife. I need to be the best friend. I need to be the best son or daughter. I need to be a great employee or employer. I need to be wise with my finances. All these things that we seek out, yes, we seek out with wisdom, but we do so knowing that first and foremost, we are his witnesses. That everything, here's the great The great coup that's happening is the enemy is causing the people in the church to forget that everything is about Jesus. Like Sunday morning's about Jesus, some Wednesday nights. But Jesus brings peace into every corner of our life that we let him in. Our purpose is to know him. And in knowing him, we will then make him known. And number five, the final reality that the risen Jesus brings to us still today is there's a party. There's a party. Listen, I, I believe that we should understand the holiness of God, and that calls for a measure of reverence. Don't, don't get me wrong. If, you, if you've been around church, you know those words. If you're new to church, don't worry about it. It's not for you anyways. There's a measure of reverence. But reverence doesn't mean a lack of joy. I mean, when the Old Testament, when, when David started to understand the heart of God, for his son, David, the king, remember David, he killed Goliath. There's this scene where David starts to comprehend just how good God is. And the dude starts dancing in the streets. I believe it's okay for the church to be filled with enthusiastic people. By the, word that, by, by the way, that word enthusiastic, the first half of that comes from two words, in theos. That means God inside. And we sell enthusiasm to the world because we got to sit there. You know. There is no greater party than the kingdom of God. There is no greater promise than Jesus. There is no greater purpose than his kingdom and his will. And we have been invited into the party, beloved. We've been given access to the celebration. And I'm convinced we are not meant to be bitter angry, subdued, hopeless people. But we are meant to proclaim hope. The text says in verse 50 that he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up to heaven. What a bummer, right? I mean been hanging out with Jesus and he's like boop see you guys later check out this trick Woo, you know he was carried up to heaven and after worshiping him they returned to Jerusalem heartbroken it would make sense no. they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they were continually in the temple praising God they got it John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you may have life and have it in abundance. 
so you could be subdued and struggle to get through life, not so you could be hopeless and you could harbor that bitterness, not so you could blend in with a broken world, but so that you can look like you know you've been invited to the party. He says, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. So my question today, beloved, as we get ready to worship is this. Have you responded to the invitation? If the answer is yes, then are you aligning your life with his? You say, well, I just, I feel so beat down. Listen, I, I don't have any more time to get into that, but this is what I'll say. What you're going through is real. Hear me again. I'm not belittling your struggles, but I promise you this. If you've said yes to Jesus, he's bigger. And if you're continually trying to accomplish a life of purpose without Jesus and you've given your life to him, then you will continue to be hopeless in that endeavor. If you've said yes to him, continue to trust him. And today, if you're not sure if you've responded to the invitation to the party that is life in Jesus, then the great news is there's no time like the present. The offer still stands, and the invitation still has your name on it. We're going to close with a time of worship. Maybe for some of us today, on Resurrection Sunday, we're going to want to just spend a few moments in prayer, asking God to remind our hearts of what we have, and you can do that. Our altar is going to be open, and our prayer team is going to be available to pray with you. You just want to walk out today and say, I, I, want, to, I want to take more advantage of what I have in Jesus tomorrow. I want to live more surrendered. Whatever it might be, that's what these men and women are going to be here to pray with you about. But today, if you don't know if you've said yes to Jesus, hear me. I'm not asking you to get your religion figured out. I'm asking you to get your relationship figured out. He still offers peace. And you won't find it anywhere else. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes. And this morning as we get ready to worship... If you know your response is to say yes to Jesus, then I'm gonna invite you to say this prayer with me. Prayer is not a magic formula. The prayer itself doesn't accomplish anything. The answer is that you believe you need Jesus and that he is who he says he is. Again, that guy Paul would write to the church at Rome and he would say this in Romans 10, 9, if anyone believes in their heart, confesses with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. Saved from sin, saved from hopelessness, saved from a life without peace. And so today, if that's your response to say yes to Jesus, the right way you are, just pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know I'm lost without you. But I believe that you made a way for me to be made whole. I believe you sent your son, Jesus. I believe he left heaven and came to earth. I believe he lived without sin. I believe he died on the cross and paid for sin. And I believe three days later, he rose again. And so today, I trust you with my life, Jesus. And I receive the gift of salvation. Thank you for loving me first. It's in your name that I pray. Heads bow for just a moment as we get ready to worship. If there's anyone in this room that today has said that prayer to give their life to Jesus because we believe in a cultural celebration, I would love to celebrate that decision. So while your heads are still bowed, if that's you, you would say, Chris, today I have given my life to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand so I can see that and celebrate it? Anybody today? Amen. Anybody else? Amen. I want you to know if you've raised your hand, You've received a gift that can never be taken away. But we do want to celebrate that decision. We also want to pray with you and we want to answer questions you might have. And so my goal is not to embarrass anyone. But before we stand and worship, anyone who raised their hand, if you'd be willing, I'd love to celebrate your decision with our church. If you would just stand where you are, people still have their heads bowed. If you would stand where you are, I've come down from the platform to meet you. I'd ask you to stand and step out of the row you're seated in and come down the aisle so that we can celebrate the work of God in your life. Anybody at all that raised their hand, are you willing to make that decision and come forward? Anybody today? I'll wait just a moment. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Congratulations, brother.
You made the best decision you'll ever make today. Right over here is Pastor John. He's going to pray with you. I'm going to ask us to stand together. And as you stand to your feet, our prayer team's coming forward. If you raise your hand and chose not to come forward, you can still come forward. Come to one of these men or women and let them know you made the decision to follow Jesus. They'll celebrate that with you. If you have a burden today that you want to leave with Jesus, that's why this team is available. For the next few moments, let's believe the Lord is still moving this Resurrection Sunday as we worship together. All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. It's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a Nothing else fit for my king except for a heart singing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, who's ready to party this morning? Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, 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 come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy of me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, 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 oh come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. All that I have is a hallelujah. No, it's not much. Fit for a king. 
except for a heart singing Oh, how. Father, today we sing hallelujah because Jesus is risen. God, I pray that the peace that comes through the resurrected Jesus would fill our hearts and minds. God, I pray that today, no matter where we are, just giving our life to Jesus or walking with him for decades, that our hearts would be filled with the good news of the gospel. And I pray today as we celebrate the empty tomb, that we would not keep that news to ourselves, but God, would you position us and open our eyes this week and today to share the greatest news that's ever been told. God, we pray that we would continue to seek you first in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful that you joined us for our 8 a.m. service. If it was your first time here at BT, I pray that you were blessed by being with the BT family. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer those. And pray that you would come back. You can check us out online at bt.church and see what we have for you and your family or follow us on social media. I'll say this as we go out today. Make sure you come back next week. We're going to launch a brand new sermon series. There's no Sunday like the first Sunday of a series. And this is why you want to be here. We're going to start about a four-month journey. And we're going all the way from Genesis to Revelation in four months. We're going to follow the story of the scriptures, and you'll want to be here for that. So come next week. Bring someone with you. I hope and pray you have a great rest of your resurrection Sunday. We go out today believing the best is yet to come, so would you help me as we declare together Ephesians chapter 3.